so um, this talk is, uh, in some ways, carries off a little bit from where Tatiana left off on the question on the question of can can we what is the possibility of social media under under capital and capitalism? What, what is the effect of capitalism on social media? I'm Dimitri Kleiner, and uh, you can reach me at those various uh, destinations if you want to. Um, I make uh, works called Miscommunication Technologies that explore the social relationships embedded in computers. R15N, the, the current one, plays very much with what Kitsiana was saying, uh, I guess uh, Franco Brody was saying about telephones, that it's, it's a social network built by uh, people talking to each other on telephones. That's R15N. And I wrote the Telecommunist Manifesto, which is, uh, which is what this presentation is about. It can be downloaded from telecommunist.net slash manifesto. So, uh, Tatiana introduced us to a whole lot of different uh, terms and, and concepts. Uh, I'm going to try to keep my talk to only a couple, which I'll refer to to try to contrast political economic concepts with network concepts, specifically looking at modes of production and network topologies, what those things mean and how they relate to each other. So when I use the word communism, it's important to understand that I'm not referring to the forms of government in historical or contemporary communist states. This is not, it's not a talk about any countries or places that have ever existed before in the world. Uh, we refer to communism as a theoretical society with no classes and no state. So a set of social relationships called communism not a place. Right, the term originates in the British and French collectivist of operatives, the followers of Robert Owen. So it's quite a, it's quite a, it's quite a lot of history long before the revolution or the Cold War or any of those sorts of things. And also capitalism, uh, in this context here, does not refer to the free market, enterprise, business, entrepreneurship, or liberal democracy. Capitalism refers to a society in which the owners of capital are able to abstain from direct production by appropriating the products of workers who employ their property in production. Right? So we're talking about capitalism once again as a mode of production, not a place, but a mode of production. Right? And the term capitalism actually originates with Ricardian socialists who were early critics of the political economy um, and was intended to draw a correlation with feudalism. So the, the, the early socialists took the, uh, what was called political economy, which explained why the landlords were uh, unfairly exploiting the capitalists, and extended that criteria to show that the capitalists were exploiting the workers. And so they used the term capitalism uh, to draw a correlation with how the capitalists were using the term feudalism. Right? And here's a famous example. They were defended by Thomas Hodgkins in 1825. Um, the lawgiver and the capitalist always compare our wages with the wages of other laborers and without adverting to what we produce, which seems the only criteria by which we ought to be paid. So Hodgkins here is one of the first people that's uh, connecting what labor produces to how much it should be paid. And so this is, this is beginning to develop positive surplus value, which is elaborated upon by Marx and others later on. Right, so in all these, in all these categories, network topologies and the modes of production, are relations and interconnections. Both economies and networks are composed of relations. Relations in a network define the topology of the network. And relations in an economy define the mode of production in that economy. Right? Now, within networks, there's, there's two basic kinds. The first one we'll talk about is a mesh network. A mesh network is a network in which all participants can interact where there's no mediation, where authorization is based on mutual configuration, and where each participant is autonomous. So in a mesh network, every user of the network has their own computer, for instance, and each computer can connect to every other computer without anybody being able to stop them or control their interactions. Everybody cooperates on the network <coughs> their roles, right? Other kind of a network is a star network. In a star network, all participants connect with the operator, and all interactions <coughs> between participants is mediated. Authorization is granted by the operator, and each participant is dependent on the operator. And it's called a star because literally like the master server is in the middle, and all of the users are connected to it like a star, as opposed to the mesh network, which is more like a fabric, where people are connected in a mesh in various different ways. Now, communism also has a set of relations. All, all participants produce as equals. Producers retain everything they produce. Participants produce for social value, and exchange is based on mutual respect. So those are the characteristics of, of a communist set of relationships, right? 
This is contracted with a capitalist set of relationship where participants are divided into classes, property owners appropriate wealth for producers, participants produce for exchange value, and exchange is based on market price. Those are some very different kinds of relations. Now, capitalists love star networks, right? Because the capitalist is the operator. Roles and credentials create classes, and mediation is needed to charge a price. So if you ever had an account on a server, you know there's different kinds of users on that, on, that, on that server. They have different permissions, and those are granted by the operator. So certain users can carry out certain operations, certain users can't. A star network makes this possible, which is quite liked by, by capitalism. And mediation is needed to charge a price, because if you aren't able to control the interactions between two given users, you can't charge a price for the interactions they may have. Right? Capitalists hate mesh networks because participants can interact directly, there's no toll gates, therefore no prices, and because there's no ability to grant privilege, there's no ability to control the interactions on the network. Right? So the internet, which I guess we've all heard of, was not created by capitalists. It was developed by universities, NGOs, hobbyists, and the military. So this is quite an important, quite an important thing. Right? The information superhighway, which is of course a joke that I'm taking from a famous Al Gore speech, um, and, uh, you know, my contention is that Al Gore was not talking about the internet. What he was talking about was what existed in the day, which were called online services. Mm -hmm. Examples of these were CompuServe, AOL, Prodigy. These were very large companies with a lot of capital, very big, very big organizations with lots of money. And they were the dominant kind of information superhighway that was available back when Al Gore made that speech. And up until the 90s, major corporations had no real internet strategy at all. Like Microsoft famously didn't have any internet strategy until already the late 90s, which is really quite late considering parts of the internet were already in existence in the late 70s. Right? So capitalist online services were client server systems with a star topology. While the internet was hosting numerous peer-to-peer -peer systems such as email, Usenet, IRC, which depend on a mesh topology. All of those technologies depend on the ability of your computer to talk to other computers in an unmediated fashion. If, you, if your email server can't talk to other people's email server, you can't send email. Right? Email presupposes a mesh network. Whereas in messages were also sent on the CompuServe network, but they were sent only to other CompuServe users and were kept within the system. Right? Because the internet is a peer-to-peer -peer system, anybody with a connection to it could also connect others. And so it experienced a period of explosive growth, which created a boom of internet service providers, which caught the capitalists totally by surprise, because the internet was this obscure network that was used in universities and NGOs and military consultants and things like that, and the, it was, the capitalists were unreally, not really paying attention to it very, 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 very much. But because the internet creates a situation where anybody with access can pass that access on to somebody else, because it's a, net, because it's a mesh network, the internet boomed in size, and all of a sudden the whole industry um, exploded, right? But what's very interesting about this industry is the exchange value these ISPs were capturing was collectively created. Like, unlike CompuServe or AOL, what was an ISP selling? An ISP wasn't selling anything that was intrinsic to its own offerings. What it was selling was access to the network, the ability to be part of the network. So for instance, if CompuServe wanted to compete against AOL, they may invest money in making their chat program better and say, hey, use CompuServe because our chat is better than AOL. Whereas in the ISPs were all giving access to the same network. There was no real way to differentiate them except for like simple raw mechanics like the amount of bandwidth for a price. But it was basically, it was basically giving access to a collectively created value, right? So the value of the network comes from the size of the network. And each ISP was independently earning income by being part of a common platform, not owned by anybody as a whole, but composed of the mutual interconnections of the participants. This does not resemble a market economy, right? but rather a network economy. Right? And capitalism actually hates competition. There's a lot, there's a lot in the media and uh, you know, in neoclassical texts about capitalism, about capitalism being very much into, into competition. But actually, um, capitalism can't sustain competition because in a theoretical free market, which actually is an ideological construct that can't even really exist, but if it could exist, it would drive all prices to the cost of production because competition would, would limit all profits. If, if, if competition eliminates profits, then there can be no capitalist class because there would be no revenues to sustain a capitalist class. So capitalism actually can't exist without eliminating competition. 
And here's a quote, don't take it from me, here's a quote from uh, Hadley, who worked for a guy called J.P. Morgan, which you also may have heard of, um, about the railroad network, right? And the railroad network was actually really interesting uh, because it has a very similar history to the internet. It was originally very much developed by public funds, and then it was very quickly privatized by the so-called robber barons, including Mr. J.P. Morgan. And, and here's a, a quote from one of his economists, railway competition may exist everywhere, somewhere, or nowhere. If it exists everywhere, rates are reduced to the level of movement charges, and there is nothing to pay fixed charges, right? So what this means is that a competitive railway network cannot afford capital, fixed charges, right? So a competitive railway network could actually not afford to build and maintain the tracks because the prices would be reduced down to the level of movement charges until the, until the tracks and uh, trains collapsed and the government would have to then come in and bail them out, right? And this time J.P. Morgan was waging a war against destructive competition, so you see how much capitalists love competition, to consolidate the railways. Right? So, with the internet, a very kind of similar thing happened. The capitalists were not happy about the internet. Right? So their reaction to it was to apply capital and simply buy everything they could. And that's, uh, and that's what we remember as a dot-com boom, the original, the original dot-com bubble. That was the result of the capitalists simply madly rushing in and going, oh my god, what is this? We need to own every bit of it. And, and like spending money quite randomly and buying everything that they could buy. Right? And, uh, and while certainly there was some spectacular failures and mismanagement of the money that they spent, largely their mission was accomplished. If you had internet access in the mid-90s, it was likely from a mom and pop ISP with a shelf full of consumer grade modems somewhere in your neighborhood. If you have internet access today, it's mostly provided by giant telecommunications conglomerates. So the mission of consolidating ownership of the network was largely accomplished, even if there was comical uh, failures in the meantime. Right? But the problem is that it still is peer-to-peer -peer mesh network, right? And so the, the, the capitalists had another problem. And how do they drive communism from the network? How do they drive this open set of social relations where everybody can talk to everybody, there's no way to monetize or profit anything because, because there's no way to put toll gates on it because it's all free. And the solution to that was Web 2.0. And Web 2.0 is, in many ways, the second wave of the dot-com boom. So after the dot-com boom kind of collapsed and all of that, it's just capital vanished the first time, but then it came back in the form of Web 2.0. And what is Web 2.0? Well, the interesting thing about the web is the web is, first of all, the web is not the internet, if anybody doesn't know that here. A lot of people kind of confuse those terms now, mostly because of the success of Web 2.0, right? The web is only one protocol and one platform that runs on the internet. And coincidentally, it's a client-server platform, <coughs> right? So, what the capitalists began to do was to impose a star topology on top of the, on top of the mesh networks. So instead of the classic peer-to-peer -peer internet, they replaced this all with web-based platforms. So Usenet was replaced by web forums, email by social media, IRC by Twitter, etc. So instead of using these peer-to-peer -peer tools on different platforms, all of a sudden they were centralized into one platform that was based on a client-server architecture. So unlike, unlike Usenet, if you're, if you're interacting with people on a web board, the person that owns that web board, like via Facebook or whatever, have complete control over the interactions. It's, all, it's always a star topology. So they can capture and monetize the user interaction, the user data that's going through. Whereas in Usenet, it's controlled by nobody. Until, until today, it's uncontrollable. Um, and so therefore, it's very difficult to make money out of it in any other way than simply providing access to it. Same with email, same with IRC, right? Which is very odd, because uh, if you remember the 90s, the core innovation of the internet was the peer-to-peer -peer technology. There was all kinds of like fantastic articles being written about how peer-to-peer -peer was revolutionizing everything. And now it's become a contraband. Now if you, if you hear the word peer-to-peer -peer in the media, it's always in a sinister context of a media of a medium being used by thieves, pirates, and other criminals, and they're actually actively engineering it out of the internet, which is a remarkable kind of like turnaround in, a, in, in, in very very short exchanging the future value of what they create for the present wealth they need to get started. So if you have an idea for a fantastic new technology, um, you have to get financing for that technology. And in order to get financing for that technology, you have to deal with venture capitalists, and venture capitalists will only give you such financing if your system conforms to the expectations of venture capital, which means that they will only finance centralized systems. 
right? So in this way, the dead stolen value of the past captures the unborn value of the future. So if we're to have a free society modeled after peer networks, free software, gift economies, and the pastoral commons, we need to find a way for innovation to be born free. And that's, and, and that, and that's really the difficult thing, because uh, myself and a lot of other people were very excited in the early days of the internet. It really seemed like you know, these kinds of social relations that we were talking about on a theoretic level uh, were actually embedded in the architecture of this new network. And so it was kind of prefiguring a set of social relations that could really have huge implications for society. But what wasn't easily apparent, apparent then is that this was only a mirage, a very temporary situation that would very quickly be corrected. And so now, when, because the, the NGOs and hobbyists that built the internet originally could not sustain an internet with, billion, with a billion users the way it is now. The only, way that, the only way that a platform can be built at that scale in this capitalist society is for capital to build it, and capital didn't want to build it that way. They, want, they had a very different idea of how to build it. Right? So capitalism requires enclosure. Without privileged access to scarce resources, it cannot capture profit. Right? And if we cannot find alternatives to capitalist financing, it is not only the internet that we know that we will lose, but also the chance to remake society in its image. Because if you believe that the ability for humans to have this kind of relationships, instantaneous global relationships, unmediated relationships around the world could have general political effect, then you know, simply moving from peer-to-peer -peer applications to you know, centralized applications is not only the fact that we don't have used it anymore, but now we have Facebook. That's not, that's not all that's at stake, but actually the chance to remodel the society that we live in around the same kind of relations. And that's the end of the, the presentation. Uh, so we can clarify or answer any questions that you may have.